accomplished athlete and consummate storyteller John Furlong had no idea what a monster project he was taking on when he agreed to help organize the 2010 Olympic Games. When he found himself at the head of the parade, his great friend Jack Poole laid out some rules in their sparse office, something like, my desk, no paper, your desk, all the paper. John Furlong, along with National Affairs columnist Gary Mason, came together to write a candid insider's book about the 2010 Games and more. It is called Patriot Hearts. It is my pleasure to welcome 2010 Sports Executive of the Year, John Furlong, back to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hi. Has the tension melted from your body yet? Uh, no, but it's, you know, it's a bit of everything. I, it's been, uh, I mean, I, to be say when the games ended, it was a, an enormous feeling of relief, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for the people on my team, it was, they didn't know what to do next because they'd been in the middle of this intense environment for so long. And, and but for me, I, I sort of was praying for this end game we were all hoping for and predicting could possibly happen. And when it's happened, I, I thought to me that was the best gift I've ever had because we had predicted if we did our work the way we were planning to, that the country would pile on. They would not watch this, they would own it and live it, and they did. And to me, it was an example of what a vision can do and how it got into everybody. And, and uh, at some point during the games, the public just jumped over the boards and they took the games to another place. Mm. And that's when Jacques Rogue, at the end of the games, he said, you know, the Olympics can never go back from this. It never seen this. It wasn't just Vancouver, it was the country. And to me, that was quite special. And I don't think anybody with a rational mind would have been prepared to come right out and predict it in advance. but. You know, we were mm -hmm. hoping for it, and uh, we got it. Well, when you were sitting with Jacques Rogue, and I believe the president of the Ice Hockey uh, uh, Association, uh, René Fassel, at the end, uh, uh, Fassel, is it Fassel, Fassel? Yes. Yes. Fassel said, um, I hope this goes to a shootout. And you said... Yes, I said, René, what on earth are you talking about? Give me a break. I started to, to look at him and think, you know, it was kind of emotional. I think, what are you talking about? This game has to end now. Like this is perfect. This needs to. St we need to put those medals around their necks and go home and get on to the closing ceremonies. And he's no, no, John. Let's have a shootout. Think about the ratings. And I think the word I said, well, bugger the ratings. Who cares? Like <laughs> Renee, it has to end. Mm -hmm. And so, and he had this grin on his face. And and then of course we they got the goal. And and we're in overtime. And the place is tension filled. And people got their hands. And everybody has every scenario figured out, including the potential that we could lose. I thought we would win, but. So we get into overtime, and there's this moment in overtime where it's tense on the ice, and, Lu and Luongo kind of chests a puck into the back corner after a little, a soft shot, not a big shot. And I look over, and Rene has got this great big smiling smirk on his face, like the world is unfolding exactly as he wanted. And I pulled my pen out, and I said, Rene, I'm just so you know, if the Americans score, I'm going to stab you in the heart with my pen. I couldn't <laughs> believe I said it, but I did, and I was, it was a moment of great shame for me. But mm -hmm. anyway. I hope it was an Olympic pen. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Good. So the power of sport to change lives, uh, we know it does. Uh, how has it changed yours from the time you were a little bat uh, to now? Well, it did everything for me because I, I, I found, I mean, I sort of came to sport in a kind of an odd way, as you find out in the book. I almost got frightened into it. It was like I got called out by a teacher and and started to play and in, on this in one day I, I it was introduced to two different sports and it was like an instant addiction because it just felt right to me you know you first of all it was the exhilaration of the exercise but also there was a sort of a code about you know you learn how to win you learn how to lose you have to play fair if you commit an infraction you get stopped and you know there was it I liked it because I was an introvert and it kind of corrected things for somebody like me and I and I also felt that when I was on the playing field that uh, it was more even for me than it was in any other thing I was doing. And I really liked it and I thought this is a great place to be. And then as I got older and I got reasonably you know, good at athletics, I thought you know, the only thing I wanted to be was an Olympian. And it never happened for me. And so this really was my chance. And I look back on this and I'd say if I had this versus that, I'd take this mm. because it was a chance to... To, to really find out about you know what's inside you, what are you, are you able to do, and I mean I'd love to have been a, be able to say I'm an Olympian, I'm not, but but to have worked with them and seen that and and done this kind of work in a country that's adopted me and. I said recently at a, at a speech I gave in Toronto, I don't know of a country anywhere in the world, and I've thought long and hard about this, is that, that where a person of another country, of a foreign accent, would, be a, would have been allowed to lead a project like this and no one even mention it. And to me, that was special about Canada and it made me feel mm. very proud. Well, we can call you an Olympian by association. Okay, that'll do. How about that? <laughs> uh, now, 
uh, that first visit you had with Mr. Jack Poole. Uh, you said at his funeral that oftentimes you were Jack Pooled. Yes. How did he Jack Pool you when you had your first conversation? Well, we were in this, it was on September 11th, the day of the bombing, and we were sitting there and talking, and he was a larger than life figure, very charming, and uh, had that look in his eye of, of a guy who was afraid of nothing. And we were talking about this, and he was talking about what he thought of the games, and I was talking to him about the, 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 it, the politics of the Olympics and how tough it is to go in and navigate your way through this. And so we're going back and forth, and we're having a lot of fun. And after two or and a half or three hours of this conversation, he looks at me and he said, okay, um, if you don't do this with me, I'm not going to do it. And I, and I, you know, he's already been offered the job as chairman and CEO of the, and I'm thinking, you know, I, it was just a weird, and I thought, wow, what a line. And I, and I didn't realize till, till later, because he tried it again and again, that mm -hmm. this is how he does. He, t he casts a line off, and he, he, he'll snap that into your jaw, and he has you, and you're doing it, and you know it's happening, but you still do it. And I remember going outside after hearing that and thinking, oh my goodness, my whole life I wanted to have mm -hmm. a chance like this, and I have no idea where to start, but, but he made this trip for me uh, stunning. What a mentor, what a wonderful friend. This man really understood understood loyalty and leadership and, and how to deal with adversity. Mm -hmm. yeah, he and he didn't guy. like conflict, and I know there was some conflict. There had to be. Yes. You have a board, uh, you're steering the team. Uh, how did you make peace? Well, Jack, um, you know, it was interesting. He didn't like conflict, but when he needed to be decisive, he was laser-like. He would make a move that mo that sorted everything out in one go. He had the master chess move. He would checkmate absolutely everybody and walk away with that big grin on his face. And <laughs> he was very good at that. And, mm -hmm. and over time, I think, he grew into totally understanding the Olympic Games, the environment we were in, and he became a master in the boardroom at, at managing personalities. And I mean, we had we, we were inseparable friends, but we had moments behind the door that were beyond belief uh, for drama. And uh, he would look at me sometimes and shake his head and wonder who, how on earth did I ever get myself into a project like this with mm -hmm. you? And then other times it would be the reverse. Yes. And we're calling each other out on things. And the best phone calls I've ever had in my life happened on Saturday mornings with Jack. They were almost every Saturday. And and he would pace his living room waiting for this call, and I would do the same thing. And we had a lot of fun, uh, but it was a way, um, it was a way to dump the pressure. And he would take it happily and take your pressure away and just to, to, to contribute to, uh, to, 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 to how he wanted you to. to well, perform. you said uh, this experience for you was like walking on thin ice. When was the ice the thinnest? Well, it was thin in a number of times. Um, you know, the, the, probably the worst period in the in the lead up to the games was when we were being called out by the media to declare what it was going to cost to build the venues. If I had a regret, one really serious regret about uh, about how we did the project is when we presented our budget in Prague about what, we, what it was going to cost. And this is Canada, and people hold mm -hmm. you to account here pretty fast. You noticed. We handed, yeah, we handed in the budget, and it was to build the venues in 2002, but we're building them in 2010. Anybody could tell that it's not going to be that number. But we weren't permitted to give a different budget. We should have done one anyway. So when we came home and the first question was asked, Jack answered it by saying, we're going to need more money. It was like a gulper of a moment, and I had to agree, but we hadn't yet determined how to do this. And the world went crazy because people said, whoa, 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 we're into this five minutes, and it's already gone up in cost. And we couldn't explain our way out, and we should have had that other number. We should have given it an inflationary treatment before we went to Prague and said to the public here, this is what it will ultimately cost mm -hmm. us. And we didn't. And right away, people were calling from my head and saying, this is incompetent. They knew this all along. They never said anything. And it was very, very difficult. Was there a time in this period when you felt like giving the people your head, when you thought, you know what? It's been a great ride so far, but I'm done. Well, actually, I did do that because between the bid phase and the uh, taking on the job of CEO, I actually did resign. I actually handed a letter because I thought we were looking poor in not moving from the bid into the operations of the games, and there was a debate going on about who the CEO should be. And I, I really honestly thought that, that when the bid was over, I would go on back to my own career. And, and but you know, it was obviously you, you you win the bid, and it's addictive, and it's alluring, and it's a fantastic project, and you see the potential, and who wouldn't want to do it? But 
but I didn't want to do it. I didn't want the job if people didn't think I was the right guy for it. And at that time, this debate was going on, and I saw everybody struggling. And I said to Jack, this has to end. They have to make a decision. And I'm fine with it not being me, but we need to make it. And I'm willing to go home and be let this go, and I'm happy. It's probably the best it's ever going to be for me until the end, anyway. <laughs> sure and you so, were. And he was mad at me, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he wouldn't accept it. But uh, I had the letter, and I actually had forgotten it until we were writing the book, and I pulled it out, and I looked at it, and it put tears in my eyes. And Jack was having none of it. And then ultimately, I think it brought the process to a conclusion, and they had their debate, and they decided it. But I did do it, and that was, it was, there were times along the way where you wouldn't be normal if you didn't get out of bed and say, you know what, I'm going to go back to bed. Sure. I had enough. Well, what were you doing in San Moritz, walking around on the street in your pajamas, in your bare feet? What yes. happened well, there? So while we were chasing votes, um, we basically set out to just be relentless. Every minute of every day was, because I, I thought we'd never be forgiven for losing this. I mean, people would never understand how Vancouver lost to a village in Pyeongchang. I mean, I, we just wouldn't work. And so, so we put every minute of every day into this, and we'd been on the road for over three weeks, no laundry left, exhausted. And that afternoon, um, I think it was a Saturday, we were, or, or a Friday maybe, we were driving through the mountains in the dark. We arrived in this little village, and I was out of my feet, and we checked into this tiny little hotel. I got into the room and lay down, and I, I put on my pajamas, got into bed, and then woke up in a complete day. I didn't have a clue where I was. I actually couldn't believe it. I, I was scared. and. And, and I, I sat on the side of the bed looking around and, and the room was dark and I went over to the door and I walked outside into the hallway and, and I walked down the hallway and I still didn't know and the, the lobby was one floor down and I went down, there was no one in the lobby. It was like one of these sort of family run hotels. And I thought, you're dreaming something's not right and I went outside and it was freezing cold and I was in my bare feet and I just, uh, but I was wanted to know where I was and so I sort of wandered along the street and two, two, two stores down there was a confectionery shop and there was these cakes in the window that looked like bobsleds and curling rocks and it started to kind of light up and I raced back to my room and honestly I thought you clown how on earth could you have put how could you have forgotten like you're losing mm -hmm. your mind I told very few people about it, other than I told my family about it, and I came back because I thought, oh my lord, they are going to write you off if you ever tell them this <laughs> well, story. So, you know, it's but a the good games are over, so sure, I Sure, now you can tell. And well, when I put it in here, I thought about taking it out again. But and it's a good thing you wear pajamas, I say. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> right? yes. International incident. Yeah. Big CEO, you yeah. know how it could have gone yeah. Yeah. with the world's press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome back with John Furlong. Patriot Games inside the Olympics that changed a country.